Once upon a time, there was a king who had no sons. But he had two daughters, and he had three chairs. When he sat in the blue chair, that meant that all was well. When he sat in the black chair, that meant that all was ill. And when he sat in the red chair, it meant that there was war. His two daughters had never seen him sit in the red chair until they entered the throne room that morning. Father, they cried, what's happened? Our neighboring kingdom has declared war on us, he said, but we have no general to lead our army, and I'm too old and sick to do it myself. I fear that we are surely doomed. When Gina arrived in the valley, in the human village, she went to the first house she saw, and she planned on offering her services as a maidservant. She knocked on the door. The mistress of the house opened the door, took a good long look at Gina, <laughs> and promptly shut the door. <laughs> Gina then went to the second house, she knocked on the door. The mistress of the house opened the door, took a good long look at Gina, and promptly fainted. Now Gina was starting to get a little discouraged, but she was determined and she wasn't going to give up. So she went to the third house. She knocked on the door. The mistress of the house opened the door, took a good long look at Gina, and was amazed at the size of this girl. Gina was very encouraged by the lack of fainting and door slamming and quickly asked if the mistress of the house needed a maidservant. And the mistress hired her immediately. Now, well, Sultan had overheard every word and he was heartbroken. So he went to pay a visit to his friend the wolf to cry about his fate and let him know that he would be shot in the morning. But wolf was crafty and clever and he had a plan. Here's what we'll do, my friend, he said. Tomorrow, when your master and mistress go to make hay, they'll bring their baby with them and place them underneath some bushes to protect him. You lie next to the baby as if to guard it, and then I'll come from the forest and steal him. When you rescue that child, they will be so grateful they'll give you whatever you want. Sultan thought this sounded like a pretty good plan, and the next morning it went off exactly as the wolf had said. Wolf crept from this forest, snatched up the baby in his jaws, and took off. So the young cowboy settled in for the night, and old man Douglas did his job which was to watch the horses, clean them up, and put out the food for the cowboys. And what he prepared that night was a very special whiskey stew. And so, as he settled down, and he prepared his meal, he leaned back against his saddle, pushed his hat back on his forehead, and he sang. And he sang, Oh, give me a home where the buffalo roam, where the deer and the antelope play. Where seldom is heard a discouraging word, and the skies are not cloudy all day. Home, home on the range. And then he stopped, as in the distance, he heard a voice reply, Home, home on the range. Well, immediately the men were on guard. They looked at each other and said, Was that you singing with him? No, no. And Father Mouse looked at the wall, and he looked at the hole, and he looked at his daughter, and he said, what? <laughs> Mother Mouse, who was not excited about the idea of her daughter living over the horizon or up a very tall hill or being blown away by the wind, looks at the hole and goes, Gray Mouse? And Little Mouse says, Well, if I am to marry the most powerful being in all the land, clearly that must be Gray Mouse, my best friend. And Father Mouse looks at the wall, and he looks at the hole, and he looks at his daughter, and he says, what? <laughs> I am Taliesin, a time traveler, a storyteller, an explorer. I've been to your world many times, but my native country is the region of the summer stars. And I've known some remarkable individuals from among the human race. I studied in India when Rome was founded. I carried a royal standard before Alexander the Great. I was chief bard to King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. And in 1963, I visited the BBC in London and encouraged them to create a TV series about a certain time traveler. That <laughs> but tonight, I'm going to tell you a story about something that happened thousands of years ago in your timeline, when I was chief architect to the royal family of Uruk, the city in Mesopotamia. This was a thousand years after the downfall of Atlantis. And I'm going to tell you the story of the education of Earth's first superhero, Gilgamesh. It's this Thank wonderful fairy tale world. All these different stories are happening simultaneously. And at the end of Act 1, it seems like everything is perfect. And then Act 
guess who happened? Everything falls apart. Mm -hmm. And that was a really validating thing for me to see at the time when it felt like everything was falling apart and to see that represented in the form of media that I just loved. So I went to see Into the Woods that night, I went to see it the next night, and just watching that musical helped me kind of start processing what had happened. There's a scene after Little Red Riding Hood has been rescued from being eaten by the wolf, and she's processing this and like, the wolf was nice, but that was experience was exciting, but not good at all. And that nice is different than good, and like processing nuance in that helped me start dealing with what had happened. So because of how it helped me cope, that just became my absolute favorite musical. Uh, so I there was, was a peasant. <laughs> Now this peasant had a pretty good life. He had his peasant bachelor pad, and a one-room hovel, but that's good for this time. And he had a pretty nice job, by which I mean he toiled in a field, but it could have been worse. And he had a dog. Not just any dog, he had the best dog. This dog was a perfectly white greyhound. He was beautiful and Smart, he knew every trick in the, well, I don't want to say every trick in the book, because this peasant could not read. And there was no book of dog tricks. But if there had been a book of dog tricks, <laughs> this dog would have known every trick in the book. You know, it wasn't quite enough. And he went wandering out into the garden one day, and he looked at the beautiful landscape garden where all the gardeners worked. And he looked at the plants, and he realized that the whole business of this garden, everything depended on the sun. Wow, sun, what power. I wish I were the sun. And the spirit of the mountain granted his wish. And he was the sun. He was enormous. He was in space and he was on fire. <laughs> so my whole life was, as a child was learning about heroes and heroines. I had them in my family. My uncle would go to the steel mills, and every night when he would come home, he would wash his shirt and wash his pants and polish his shoes till you could see your face in them. And every morning he would put on his clean white shirt and his gold cufflinks and his pressed jeans and his shiny boots and go to work in the mills. And every night he would come back and you could hardly recognize him, covered in soot and grime and sweat, his shirt gray, his jeans filthy, and his boots scuffed. And every night he would repeat the process of polishing his boots. And I asked him one time, why? Now here was a man who never took life seriously. The kind of guy who would say things, things to me like, damn, you know, if it wasn't for time, we'd have to do everything all at once. <laughs> <laughs> or if it wasn't for poverty, we wouldn't have nothing. <laughs> <laughs> or when I got married, he said, just remember some one good turn gets most of the blanket. <laughs> <laughs> but this was the man who turned to me in that moment and said, no matter what you do in life, if you can't be proud of doing it and show others you're proud of doing it, shouldn't do it. Maybe the only time he was ever serious to me. But I don't remember that time. <laughs>